This episode is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. Enved has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost a year now, and I can't begin to tell you how it has improved my life. They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused, then a drop of relief for my aches and pains and inflammation after a run or a workout. Then I do a drop of the relax before I go to bed to help me sleep. I've gotten some of the best sleep that I've had in years. Uh, And now with my whoop band, uh, my recovery band, I can prove it. And now they've come out with a new mixture called immunity, uh, which we all need to stave off uh, COVID-19. The immunity boost is a mixture of turmeric, grapefruit extract, elderberry, licorice root, and vitamin C, which we all could use a little bit more, I'm sure. I just got my first shipment in and took my first drop this morning. Uh, They come in drops, which is my choice, a tincture, roll-ons for those aches and pains, and then also gummies, which I think a lot of people out there use the gummies. So you can get it however you choose. So go place your order today. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe during these crazy times. So let's get to this week's episode. This episode of the Golf Guru Show is sponsored by Straight Down Golf Apparel. I am very excited to announce that I have become a brand ambassador for Straight Down. Uh, Thank you so much for Mike Rowley and the team for inviting me into this family. And I am very excited to start to share uh, the mission that I feel very strongly about. As Mike Rowley founded this Straight Down a company in 1989, uh, which started as a small t-shirt company, but shortly grew into a full range golf and lifestyle apparel brand that is now worn by some of the top athletes in the industry and now by the guru, which I'm super, super excited about. Uh, his love of golf translates into the products and this stuff is awesome. I can't wait to uh, share some of the stuff on Instagram and the videos I'm doing for Swing You. And with all of you. So if you want to know more about uh, this brand, go to straightdown.com and check it out. So let's get to this week's episode with Coach Amanda Smith. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now, before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now, let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton, and I am the Guru, where it is my mission to interview the top golf instruction minds in the business or high performers in all various fields, break them down, get them to share all their stories, best practices, and information that have made them successful, then share it with all of you so we can all grow together as coaches and as human beings. Thanks again for all your support of the podcast and make sure you download this episode and hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows that come your way. On this episode, I dive back into the college coaching realm as my guest is Coach Amanda Smith. Amanda is the assistant men's and women's coach at Tennessee Tech University. We had the head coach Polk Brown on last week. You want to go check that out. Fantastic interview, uh, but you're going to love this one as well. Uh, Coach Smith played her college golf at Indiana State University. She's a great player and also played professionally for a few years and an even better coach, as you're going to find out. Coach Smith and I have been threatening to do this since last fall when I got to know her a little better at one of my son's college golf tournaments and learn, uh, one, she was a fan of the show, which I was a big, that was a huge honor. And the more I got to know her, the more interesting her journey was and just couldn't wait to learn more about her. So in this wide-ranging conversation, uh, other than her coaching advice, we talk about her love for poetry, uh, rap music, 
and how an improv class changed your life. So this is a very, very interesting conversation. Now, there's so many life lessons and incredible coaching tips uh, in this interview that I won't bore you with another second. So here's the brilliant and talented coach, a.k.a. DJ Amanda Smith. Enjoy. Coach Smith, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know we've uh, talked about doing this for a long time, and I'm really excited to, to catch up with you and, and to see what's going on. How you doing? Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you for having me on. Honestly, yeah, I, I know we've kind of just semi talked and and uh, kind of threw out some different stuff to talk about and all that. But um, yeah, it's great to be on here. Absolutely. So, so for those that don't know you, and we'll get into it, some of your story. Let's just give them a little history, a little origin of kind of how you got into golf. Give us a little uh, snapshot of your childhood, because uh, I know you're a great player. You played. You played golf in college, and then now you're a coach. So let's let's take the listeners on that journey uh, the best we can, and then we'll kind of get into some other topics. Yeah, yeah, of course. I uh, grew up in Canton, Ohio. Um, first started playing golf, actually didn't like it. Um, my mom was the one who kind of introduced it to me, um, but she did it by taking my sisters out and playing with them. And then finally I got really jealous and was like, all right, I'm going to try this thing out. I want my mom's attention. So right. went out there, played with her, um, and then eventually my sisters just gave it up. They kind of just did their own thing. Um and not very much into athletics and stuff, um, but I mean, they were they were great. And then so um, went out and played with her a lot. Um, started kind of doing stuff with the neighborhood friends, playing with them, and then started playing in high school and really liking it. Um, kind of transferred myself over to that sport more and kind of um, got away from all the other stuff I did as, as a junior. What did you um, do? Then, what what other sports did you do besides golf? Like I'm I played. Just curious. Yeah, I played basketball, um, soccer, tried soccer, um, was put at goalie just because, I mean, it was it was a lot of running, so they just put <laughs> me at goalie because they knew. You know when you watch those old videos of yourself when you're like your parents filmed them? You yeah. know how all the little kids are the ones that are like, they're in a ball. They're like running in a ball. Yeah. I was always the kid that was following that ball of kids <laughs> of trying to like get the ball. So they knew I was way back there, so they threw me at goalie in that. Um, and so, yeah, played that, played a little bit of tennis, swimming, just kind of like the summer stuff um sure. and then um i also threw i threw shot put and um the uh, discus so i did that my senior year um i thought that just looked fun so Dang. i was like oh i get to try Strong. that <laughs> yes yeah yeah my mom's like don't hurt yourself don't hurt yourself i'm like all right let me throw this thing as far as i can That's possible great yeah, so um, did that in high school, um, and then just decided I, I really wanted to try to take it further and get better at golf as best that I could, and um, had actually got um, a, got in a visit with Kent State, and that was surprising because they're a really top top level program, and it um, they're fairly close to home, so um, that kind of I mean that boosted my confidence um, a little bit in myself, and kind of been like, okay, I can I can play this game at the next level, um, and so. I did a walk on with them and um, or sorry, a, um, a visit with them. And right. then they um, they kind of uh, kind of I wouldn't say offered me, but they kind of said, hey, you could have the potential to be a walk on here. Um, and I kind of was in the back of my head. I, I really wanted to just play. I wanted I knew I'd probably have to wait a few years to mm -hmm. to uh, jump in that and to actually play in tournaments with them. So um, I had reached out to Indiana State. And their head coach had just recently got there. He was recently hired on, um, was trying to put a team together. Um, There's going to be five of us going in um, my freshman year. So he was pretty much building from scratch and um, took a visit there um, all the way out in Terre Haute, Indiana. And I just fell in love with, like, just his coaching style, just how, how he really wanted me to just get out there and play as much as possible. Um, so decided to, to say yes to Indiana State went all the way out to Terre Haute, played with them um, for about four years, and then decided to get my graduate as well there, and then was a graduate assistant. And, oh, my gosh, it's so it's so different on the other side of things. Right. And so I learned a lot about how to just manage my mind out there because I was out there with a lot of the, the younger players and seeing them come in as freshmen and, and just – the the anxiety or the worry or the stress and it's like you've already done all the work like you're here playing <laughs> in tournaments like trust yeah. in that so it was really cool to kind of give that energy and that vibe to them just after I got done playing and kind of letting them know that 
so my head coach was older and kind of was more experienced and kind of played a higher level. But the way that I kind of helped them was saying, hey, I've had this failure too, or I've gone into this tournament like thinking like this. Mm-hmm. And now I've kind of adjusted just because after playing in so many tournaments in college, you kind of just, you get in that rhythm and knowing kind right. of how to handle that stuff. So what, so let me interrupt you there just for a second to take, to like take the listeners back, especially like the young girls out there that are, that are getting into golf and like maybe, thinking about playing college golf, think back like the first time you thought maybe I have a chance, right? What was, was, what was that, what we'd call sort of ignition or that time? Was it a tournament? Was it somebody that encouraged you? And then like maybe even talk about your development of how yeah. you got to that level. Cause I mean, you, you kind of skipped over a lot right there as far <laughs> as just, it's important, right? So I think your yeah. story, your story is very, is very fascinating, but I think it would be helpful for somebody out there listening going like how do I get to a D1 level like yeah. what did you do Yeah um well I would say it really jumped when I played really well at state like it, I think there was like what a, year I want to say my senior year which is wild oh, wow. it's yeah okay. it's wild that it took it that long and um I think because I shot 78, 73 or something like that. And just that 73, I think it gave attention. And then I got an email from Kent saying, hey, we saw your swing on the range, all this stuff. And Mm. um, I think that really boosted my confidence, kind of knowing that they were even looking at me. Um, But back, I want to say back then, I really didn't, I mean, to be honest, I didn't put forth a lot of effort to talk to colleges because I didn't really think I was that good. Um, Surprisingly, like I, I really didn't, I didn't know. I think it took a lot for people to, I needed that validation when I was younger and needed that like, Hey, um, there's a lot where people are seeing other stuff rather than the scores that you're just putting out there. I need it. I needed that personally. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I got that when I got, when I talked to the head coach, Greg town, um, at Indiana state and just knowing that, Hey, it's going to take a lot of growth and development for you to get to where you think you want to be. And and I didn't know that I could potentially get that way because I didn't know where I was at to begin with. I kind of was was on the edge of saying, I mean, I I don't know if I can play going into my senior year when finally somebody said, "Hey, we're looking at you. Hey, yeah. we still have you ha- you have this option to come play for us. Like we a Division 1 program is I mean, when when you don't think that you're going to be able to do that and you have someone a coach saying that to you, you really kind of then start to say, oh, my gosh, hey, yeah, maybe I can. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm seeing things that, that I never saw before. And, and I did, like, the thing was I did put in the work. I did I did go see somebody over the winter time in Ohio and, and train and stuff like that. But I think when you got, as girls, I don't know if it's, it's just our the way our minds think we we really compare ourselves to ourselves to others mm-hmm. and we see another girl that may win a tournament and we say and they get a division one um offer and you're kind of like oh they want a tournament and i never want a tournament so i must not be as good as them or that's yeah. what it takes to be a division one player and it's like i think it's that relationship that you build with that coach that says hey no we we think you're this good we think you have the ability to do this and then to be able to say okay i can grow into this was huge for me to say that to myself how important was uh, the support of like your mo- your mom or your parents coming up? Because your mom's obviously a good player. We're talking about how you guys had a nice match today. Yeah. Um, and and who were who were some other influences in influences in your childhood that sort of pushed you in that direction? I would say yeah, my parents were huge. Um, my mom was she was very much for saying hey you have this you you have this ability to play you have. Um, you love it and you can tell that you love it. She would always kind of say that to me and say, Hey, let's go play. Like she just really wanted me to get out there and she knew the joy that it gave that golf gave me. And my dad, um, my dad was just so supportive in anything. It, It didn't matter. Like he, and it's wild to think that now, like, I was, I have two older sisters and I was pretty much the boy in the family. Like he, he grabbed me and was like, all right, we're going to go play catch. Like we're going to, like him and I, the crazy, like him and I ride motorcycles together. Like we just rode a motorcycle the other day together, like just going on little journey, like just adventures together. And, and so to know that he, the one to grab, like to make his daughter go learn how to ride a motorcycle, like that's, (laughs) that's some scary stuff. Like to support me in that way is already a whole nother level. So, um, he just was very supportive on finding the right fit and finding the, 
the kind of mentor that would be willing to say to push me and to give me that little bit of edge and say you know you have this ability so um, I would say those two would probably be um, my top when I was younger Um, Mm -hmm. my my coach that was um, my golf coach was he was just a big goofball like he was like our I wouldn't say like our babysitter but he just made everything so much fun like we have this joke my teammates and I like he could only see us from green to tea in high school you can't I guess you can't really go and and talk to them I think that's how it was back then but um I'm pretty sure high school coaches can talk to their players now when they're playing yeah yeah, but yeah yeah, but we just saw pictures of him like talking with us and I talked to my old teammate the other day and we were like what did he even say to us like I think (laughs) he was talking about what kind of food we'd be having after the round or something like there was no golf talk so he was very supportive in a way of saying And he played still, so he was very supportive and just kind of being that buffer of you can take it seriously and at times you can have fun. Mm -hmm. So there was a level for me to see that and to kind of gravitate towards that, not so much as some a parent that might be like, You gotta do this, you gotta do this, or a coach that says, You gotta do this, you gotta do this. It's more of, hey, there's a time to kinda make this game fun and there's a time to kinda to know when you gotta get better at something and to have him kinda be that little that little baby voice in my ear saying that growing up, I think made a lot of difference. Did you have like a swing coach or any like did you have lessons? I mean did there were any yeah. any influences in that, that part of your game? Yeah, so um, we belonged to a country club when I was younger, and um, Greg Mathis was a head pro. He's still the head pro now, um, and he would come and help me every so often um, in the summertime. He'd kind of help a little bit with short game stuff. Um, he gave me one lesson on putting, and, I mean, that he probably helped me a lot on putting, but overall I was terrible at putting, so I probably needed to see him a lot more. Um, that was more of just, like, me, I guess, just being more into my swing than anything. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I also went indoors to, um, John Maldivan. Uh, he's big out in, um, like Northeast, Northeastern Ohio. Um, so got to see him a lot, um, with other high school athletes and just see him maybe, I think it was once every two weeks I would go see him and he would kind of just show, show me some swing stuff indoors and he'd have a whole setup where it had a track man. It had kind of, he compared me with a lot of different, uh, LPJ players and where I needed to have my swing plane and mm-hmm. and I mean when I was kind of getting into it I guess I was oblivious to a lot of it and just kind of was sure. like all right show me what to do like I'll, I'll do that and so he would draw pictures which was really cool and he kind of understood that I was more visual than anything Your visual kinda. learner yeah sure yeah yeah so he it was really helpful for him to do that I think I still have some of the the like sheets that have the pictures of me and like where my hands were I'm still working on that stuff which is <laughs> like which it aggravates me but <laughs> but it's kind of funny to like see that that was kind of how yeah. he was teaching me and I, I didn't even put forth the the thought to think okay this is kind of he's he knows how to teach somebody like me and and he's worked on that skill and he's worked on saying hey are you a visual learner do I have to kind of kind of like push you in the direction of kind of seeing where you need to have your hands or are you feeling mm-hmm. it are you feeling it more so it was cool to see he was able to do that with me as a high school student and I was oblivious to it so you go to college right and you have mm-hmm. you have a nice little career and like talk a little bit about that and how you transition and and made the decision to, to try to, you know, play at the next level because you turned pro. Yeah. So you must have got, like, really good pretty fast, it sounds like. It, cause it sounds like you're kind of a late bloomer, obviously, you know, playing well as your senior year and then going in. Like, what what spurred you on when you got to college that, that made you so much better? And then talk a little bit about how you transitioned into the next level. Yeah, so um, I guess it had to have been when I really came in and I – it was my first practice, I want to say, and everybody was hitting their shots, and I'd, I'd seen kind of the older girls, and I was very, um, I guess, just, like, taken over by how it should look and how every player should be and, and all this stuff, and, and then when I got to the range, I was kind of like, they're not hitting it that great. I was like, they're kind of learning the same thing I'm learning, so it almost was like I, I, I kind of saw, I almost thought of it as so high up rather than thinking like I could be a part of this, like I'm, I'm here and Mm -hmm. I'm working on the same stuff they're working on. Um, and I want to say I texted my coach, it was coming up on the first tournament and I texted my coach and I was like, Hey, you haven't told me if I'm going to the first tournament or not. Like it was like two days before we were going to leave. And he's like, he texted me, he's like, shut up, you're going. 
He's like, you don't even need to ask me that. And I was like, oh my gosh. okay. <laughs> like, and <laughs> I mean, if you met my coach, Greg Town, he's like, oh my gosh, his, he has no planning skills. It's just like, <laughs> I don't know how it is. Like I, I, it's, oh man, he's, he's a mystery. He's great. He's a mystery though. So he kept me <laughs> on my toes every time. And I like, I remember reading that text back and just like smiling and just being like, all right, here we go. Right, here we and go. So, yeah. And so he was. <laughs> he kind of threw that confidence in me early on to say like, why, like, why wouldn't you be at the first tournament and stuff? So, um, kind of a little bit more transitioning into my junior, I would say freshman, sophomore year, I was, um, he challenged us a lot with different swing stuff, different mechanics on that. He really wanted us to learn mental toughness and that. And, um, Mm. he'd have people just like, people would come to the range and just, he would have the people that were on the range, like the older people or whatever on the range. He would just call them over and be like, hit this shot. Like Amanda hit this shot for this guy. Putting pressure on you. Yeah. Yeah. And we're like, I don't even know who this man is. Like what? Like, (laughs) and the guy would be like, Oh, great shot. And you're like, okay, I like, I I hit the tree. And coach is like, no, he's like, that was great. That was perfect. And we're like, you're crazy. But he kind of was like, yeah, he was pushing that onto us without us even knowing. And, Mm -hmm. and so, and then junior year, I want to say, um, I, we started working with this guy, uh, Jamie Gilbert came in with train to be clutch. It was, uh, mental, mental performance stuff. And, and so he kind of, he came in and, and threw the idea of, um, uh, just journaling and, and books and, and being able to really, to know that you haven't really tapped into any of that stuff. Yeah. You can go play. Yeah. You can mark down a score and stuff, but he's like, what are you doing outside of golf? Like really pay, what are you paying attention to? And mm-hmm. so he, he really, he grabbed me at that point And I said, oh man, I'm, di- I'm diving into this stuff. So I want to say it was my junior year and it was conference. And, um, I went, I think 75, the first round and I can't remember, maybe 74, the second round. And I just remember we were so close to, I think we were in third place going in the last day. And I just have this thought in my head. I'm thinking about the seniors and I'm thinking about, uh, my best friend who wasn't going to be on the team anymore. And just the emotions before you go out and play in your conference is like, oh, mm-hmm. it's it's just so high. It's You're not even thinking about golf at that point. You're thinking about, all right, who I'm going to say bye to. And 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 so I remember um, my junior year just kind of – it. I had a lot happen to me. My aunt had passed away, and, and so I, I missed a tournament because of that. And I really, I was diving into all this stuff. So I was like, I I can tell something is going to happen. I can tell there's going to be a turnaround. And I just remember um, it was the last day of conference. And I would, I would like, it was out of my mind. It was like that flow that you feel. Yeah. And I was going in the last hole. And um, at that point I was uh, on the verge of shooting three under going to the last hole. And I just got word that we were like out of it by two shots. Like we only had to make it up by two shots to get first place. And so I'm like, okay, I don't know why they told me this. Like, this could be really bad. <laughs> was, was that helpful or not? <laughs> it was, um, well, it, I guess it was helpful because, like, looking back, like, I, I still Depends on what happened play. in the last hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I had um, – I teed off and um, I get up to my ball and our assistant coach is, is sitting right there and she's looking at me and I'm like, okay, like, uh, she's not giving me any feedback. I don't know what she's going to say. And she goes, um, I have good news and I have good bad. I have bad news. And I was like, all right, like I can kind of see what I'm looking at. And she goes, good news, you're in the fairway. Bad news, you're in a divot. So oh. I was like, yeah. And I mean, going back to Coach Town, like he said, the on the 18th hole of a tournament of like anything huge, you want to be in a divot. You want to ask to be in a divot. And I was like, once again, this man is crazy. I don't know why I trusted him with four years of my life. Um, but so I was in a divot and she's like, well, how are you going to hit this? I was like, I, I'm just going to, it was a, I had a four iron in my hand and oh I was like, gosh. I'm just, yeah, I'm like, and there's water on both sides. I'm like, I'm just going to swing really hard at it. Like I don't, <laughs> I'm going to aim it at the green and just swing really hard. And so, uh, I did that and I was probably about, I want to say, uh, I hit it. I hit it at like with my eyes closed, I think. And it just made it on the green. And, and so I remember seeing my whole family up there and seeing my teammate and, and I was like, you know what, I'm just grateful to be here. And it all kind of just hit me at that point that I didn't have to, I don't know, like all the stress of it, all of everything that kind of that thought of, I can't compete. I can't, I, I, 
why why would I even think I could be a Division One player? Why would I even think that I could like it? All kind of just it was weird. It almost just rested. It almost wow. was just like I. I I'm here. And so just seeing my family and I mean, I get emotional now just kind of thinking about it. Yeah. And I, dra- I ended up draining that putt. Oh my and, gosh. I was going to yeah. say, what happened? I'm yeah, on the so edge I of my shot, seat right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I shot 68 and, um, me, me personally, I got second place, but unfortunately our team had lost by one stroke. Uh. So, but at the same time it was, I don't know, it was something that I kind of look back on and, and I shared a lot with some of the players that I used to coach at Indiana state and just kind of saying, um, you know, it's, it's those memories. It's, it's the thought that kind of what brought you to that point, what was your mm-hmm. thinking before that point and kind of where have you really been, been centered and where have you really kind of understood that if you're in that position, if you have that circumstance that happens to you, is there something that you're really going to take from that? Is there something you're really going to learn from that? And kind of just knowing that, you can have defining moments and, and kind of where is where is that leading you to? And and I love kind of just being able to, to I guess, reflect on that and know that yeah. that's possible. It's, it's so rare to have somebody at that age have that kind of self-awareness, I think, nowadays. Mm-hmm. And you're finding that now that you're coaching, I'm sure. Yeah. But that's that's fantastic that you can reflect on that. That's such a great story and such a great defining moment, as you say. Um, so, so you go, so that was junior year, right? Is that what you said? Yeah. 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 So what, so senior year, was it any better? Like, did you have, like, again, you're, you're thinking about like, what am I going to do after college? Mm -hmm. So, so take us, take us to that point. Yeah. So senior year was kind of, I think that one was my coach had really, we talked about, he's like, man, you can really win one now. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, that's crazy to think that I could really win one. Um, and I got in a position to, I almost did, I almost won the, our home tournament. I got second place, um, to one of my teammates, actually. Um, oh, wow. she'd always been, yeah, she'd been, she, I think she'd won, she actually won the Tennessee Tech one that we hosted, that, um, we host, that Tech hosts, um, down in Sevierville. So she won mm-hmm. that, I want to say it was, it was my junior year, her sophomore year. She ended up winning that one. So she, she had a couple wins under her belt. And I remember that one, um, getting second place at that one. And then um, I want to say I really didn't have the best senior year but um, with, like, wins and stuff like that. But I knew overall my confidence in coming into these ones that I was I was an upperclassman. I was someone um, that kind of took on a leadership role, but also someone that at tournaments I felt like I was a, a top dog. Like, I felt as though I was, um, as a senior, you feel – um, even though you might not shoot well the first day, you still have that confidence that you're going to bring it back the second day. So it was more of the team aspect I really wanted sure. rather than just myself. I kind of felt going into that senior year. Um, and that, that really meant more to me, I think, and, and knowing that I could still put forth an effort for my team than, I mean, winning one would have been great for me, but we won one in uh, Evansville, and that felt amazing just to, just for us to – be around each other and and to know that we're the five I think it was five seniors at that point that we came in as a group and were able to win one in the fall nice so yeah. so it sounds like you were starting to take on that leadership role you know and the traits that that you're probably using now as a coach like how would you define your leadership style like when you were in college and then we can obviously we're going to transition into your, into your coaching but I mean I think that that's really an interesting take on on where you were at that, at that time. And I'm sure it's something that you, you tell to the the boys and the girls you're coaching now, because it's so important in a team sport like golf to have that leader. So what was, what, how would you describe yourself at that point? Like what was your style? And then like sort of how, how did you, I guess, how did you transform the rest of the team? Yeah. The, one of the first books that Jamie had actually recommended was question behind the question. And that one really draws on ownership and really draws on, on, it's not about the blame you can put on other people. It's more of um, the question you're asking yourself. Did I really put forth an effort for that? Did I really um, take ownership of this thing? And so what I did a lot of, I really, I really did try to take ownership and say, Hey, just if if one of the, my uh, teammates had left practice early or something. And I really drawed it back on myself as like, how could I have done a better job of maybe helping them to stay or maybe kind of helping them to see that it's not just about them or what could I have done to really 
um, to really be that other voice and not say, oh, they're just not going to put forth an effort because that's them, you know. And so I think I, I really threw that on myself to, to say that I needed to find ways of owning that and owning that I could I could bring that up and kind of say get through the hard parts about being on it, being a teammate and being kind of the older one and say, I'm going to call you out. Because I don't want to be in that position where I didn't say anything or I didn't feel the need to maybe have you come in and, and do this with us or, or not mm-hmm. get the invite to do this. So that was a huge book for me to see that and, and for it to even come up that I had that ability to have a voice. Um, I think uh, when you're an underclassman, you, you lean towards, okay, this other person's going to make the decisions and I shouldn't question it because then I'll maybe get told that I – can't hang out with them or something just something mm. stupid but right yeah well that's that's what you when you're 20 years old that's how mm-hmm. you think right i mean but it sounded like you know you to lead a lot of times you have to gain respect from the from the group and you clearly have done that yeah you know and that's i think that's a big part of it because now you're you're gaining that respect through your actions of working harder like you said staying longer after practice doing the work mm-hmm. so where did, where did that come from you think from your childhood or is there anything that influenced you to, to give you that drive? And then I want, I want more book ideas. That was great. That was such a great lead, lead in because that's one of my questions is because I know you're a big reader like I am and I'm curious yeah. to, to hear that, but give me, give me the first uh, answer and then we'll talk a little bit about your book ideas. Um, I think my coach did coach town was, I mean, he told you like, he just told you straight up, like there's no sugar coating. Like if it, trying to think of a time where he kind of really put it on me um oh man I really wish I could think of something right now but he was one to like if you thought if you thought your swing should look like something or or you kind of had it maybe um where you'd been testing it out and he's like what are you doing why are you doing that and he's like you gotta do it this way man like what are you doing like hit it just like this and so he would do it he's like he'd give you the club and you're like okay what did you even do and then he pretty much just hacking at it he's like nah man like that's wrong what are you doing so oh he was very it was very much like um and one another thing too he was a huge storyteller he pretty much got his his motivation through that he got his idea of um in the bus rides he would kind of I don't know, the way he would interact with us was just, there was one one story that he loves to say, um, it's the, I think, 281, it's like, it, it takes a boat, when the water is 280 degrees, it won't boil, but when it's 281 degrees, it'll boil, and it'll move a boat, and that boat can take so many things over to, to certain certain things, I mean, you're, you're, you're pretty much transporting what somebody needs from one country to the next or something. It's mm. like just with that one degree. And and it's just like the stories like that. You're kind of like, what the, how did he think of this? But then you're also, I'm like, I'm thinking about it right now. And so yeah. you understand that that's kind of, I guess, the, the way to motivate people and, and to know that kind of that ownership and and he knew who he was. He knew the kind of style that he wanted to put out there. And for mm-hmm. me to see that and being like, you know, I can tell this person straight up that I really don't trust them right now. Like, hey, you, you, we, you didn't, you broke my trust when you did this, and and for them to kind of say, oh man, I'm sorry, or for me to say I'm sorry, you know, like that that was huge for him to be so direct with us. It really helped us to be direct with ourselves and to say that, hey, I can speak up when I need to, and and also. Um, I'll listen to you when you speak up. And he did a right. great job of that. And that's kind of, when I think of a leader, I, th- I think of that. I think of him being able to do that with us. And, and I mean, we're young. We're so, like, obnoxious and we're girls. And, and it's kind of like for him not to be, like, every five seconds, like, what are you doing? It was, <laughs> it, I mean, he, ch- he chose to do it that way. And I think that was something for me to see that and to, to feel it and to know the motivation behind that mm-hmm. really kind of struck my chord and was saying, this is how you should lead. You shouldn't lead by just telling somebody what to do. You're not going to, no one's going to just do what you tell them. They're going to, they're going to want to feel like you, you have their best interest. You that's have right. something that that's really going to, to help them out in the end, not just get them to, to do something just because you say so. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, that's really good I mean, because there's different styles of leadership, right? And I think it's, you know, being able to formulate that to whatever group there is, whether it's a, a girl's golf team or a guy's golf team, like it's it's not easy. 
Uh, I'm sure that's, I'm sure he's, he's thankful to hear that he had an impression on you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> even yeah. though he, he probably was like, I was so dumb. I was like, you know, I was telling these <laughs> goofy stories. That I can't believe she remembers that. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but yeah, so, so let's talk about some of the books that have influenced you, you know, not even just golf. I know you're big on the mental side, which is why I wanted to have you on as well. Cause I think just talking to you, your insights are, are fantastic, but any other, any other books that maybe you have recommended to friends or would recommend to, to the listeners and it doesn't have to be golf related. If you could share some of those and, t- and like why. Yeah. Um, I would say one that kind of drew me in was uh, talent code. Um, yeah. that one Daniel is, Coyle. Uh, yes. Yeah, I fantastic. don't know why. Yes. It's, I mean, he starts off with the, the first story of, um, I want to say this, this girl who was a young pianist mm-hmm. and it was where she just put in, I mean, the way that she practiced was the way that she kind of really developed. It wasn't about, okay, I'm going to just do 10 hours of playing this song over and over and over again. It was the time that she spent on each chord, or it was the the way that she kind of was able to challenge herself in this part, and then the next day she challenged herself in another part. It Mm -hmm. was kind of how the brain can, can learn in that systemic way, and then it's kind of outside the realm of what everybody might think is how the brain can kind of operate. So for me to hear that, I was kind of like, and you can, you can tally it so well with golf because for me, he, my coach was very mechanical. So he would, he would give us something to work on for like 30 minutes. That was just mechanics. Like I could care less where the ball goes. Just really try to dive into this, feel it out. What does it feel like? And then aim at this. And then let's see if we can do it by, by getting it to that certain point. So for me to kind of, to throw those two things together and know it was block versus drill practice was yeah we were doing a little bit of both at the same time we were doing block and drill all in one all in one instance so for me to read that book and say okay this is how the brain really wants to try to to learn it kind of was like okay this is yeah. this is something that might this, that was a big interest me yeah it's one of my favorite books too it's they called it deep practice right we talked mm-hmm. about doing things in slow motion talked about doing things wrong, right? And learning how to do it wrong before you can kind of feel the right side of it. I mean, it was, and it wasn't even a golf book like that. And then that was, it's been very famous in the teaching circles in the last five to 10 years. So that's, that's fantastic. That's one of my favorite books as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, what else you one, got? Probably, um, this one was more with uh, training to be clutch too. It's called burn your goals. Um, that one was, um, kind of, it was the counterculture approach, I guess, to really learning different things and saying, um, yeah, you can have this goal in mind, you can have this, but what are you really doing in the process to get there? Mm. Um, it, it really drew on, um, are you putting, w- one of the stories was, are you putting first, thing, first things first? Um, that's really where something that hit my chord too is as a college student, are you putting the first things first? Do you really even know what the first things are in your life, you know, and kind of, and not putting your goal in front of those. It, it might be where you're putting those first things first and second, second things won't be suppressed. So mm. if you do get better at, at how you eat, if you do get better at, at kind of managing how you, how you want to, um, I guess, go into practice, are you managing yourself mentally to be able to stay out there um, for 18 holes? Like what are you doing in that instance? And when you're doing those things, your second things won't be suppressed your goals will just happen and so that for me was huge to see the stories behind that it was also um they take into account like that it's okay to fail um at your goal it's okay to be to to not let that define you i guess and and to say that it's all it's all in the process of things um so they did a really good job of kind of just they every chapter was a different story um and it couldn't, it didn't have to be, it was a lot about business or it was a lot about, um, relationships. Majority of it was relationships. So for me to read that pretty young was huge. That's a good one. Burn your goals. Um, I want to say any John Gordon one, you just throw it in the mix. Um, yeah, he's good. Yeah. Yeah. The seed was big for me back, um, back when I was in college, that was a huge one. Um, a couple other ones. Um, I think there's so many that I've just, throwing yeah. in the mix um i would say who's the one we always talked about uh he does another podcast too tim ferris yes tim yeah, yeah. Ferris. tools of titans yeah, yeah yeah that was a big one that was huge just to yeah we talked about mimes. that i think in one of the tournaments 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just seeing the people he had on that on his podcast and seeing what people said about yeah. just different questions that were just tribe out of mentors might have been the one we were talking about too. Yeah, the, yeah. with eleven questions. Yeah, and that's a lot of the questions I ask sometimes on the show um, mm-hmm. that I got from him. So that's a, that's fantastic. What about yeah. like mental golf books? I know you're you're big into the mental side. Like, what who have been your influences? It doesn't have to be a book, but how did you get that information that maybe now you're sharing um, with your with your team? Yeah, so um, I'm on right now. Every shot has a purpose. That one's pretty big with uh, Pia and, uh, and Lynn, Lynn. I think yeah, yeah Lynn. Lynn and so, yeah. Mm-hmm, the um, Golf Fifty Four. That one's huge. Um, and then I li- I read a lot of the Golf is a Game of Confidence. I know that one. Um, Rotella stuff. So, yeah, yeah, Rotella yeah. stuff. It's it's mm-hmm. very much where it's it's cool that he kind of brings in a lot of the pros and seeing how they think and kind of bouncing ideas off of them and how simple it is. Um, to kind of find yourself relating to those and then kind of being able to to say or talk about that with other people, I think is huge with, with his books, Rotella books. Um, the one that was made into a movie was really good. Uh, pretty small. Oh, man. Um, it was... Oh, the Utopia book? You talking yes, about, yeah, Utopia. That, uh, um, what's his last name's Cook? I think they wrote the book. Yeah, David. David seven Cook. Da- yeah, David Cook. Yeah, Seven Days in Utopia. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, yeah. feel, so, trust. Yeah, yeah. So f- getting those, and then I got to see him in um, uh, Las Vegas for the Women's Golf Coaches Association. Oh, they good. had him on the panel, and so his stories, that kind of d- how he developed into being able to write that, I think mm-hmm. was huge, too, seeing him talk about that. And, and that was a really good book that kind of – you you – relate to it so much that you're kind of like, man, I th- why do I think like that? And to know there is a simple solution. Yeah. It's, it's a simple solution, but you got to practice it. So That's it's like right. cool to see how that, how that book kind of simplifies it, I guess. I love it. All mm-hmm. right. So let's, let's transition into another this is a totally different topic here. Cause I wanted to catch this before we got into the coaching stuff, okay. but the topic is poetry. Okay. All right. So <laughs> All right. I've heard that, you participated in some poetry slams. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe doing some, yeah, doing some poetry in, in, in live audiences and whatnot. So, talk about how that came about and like when did that start or begin for you? <laughs> um, I want details. Man, oh my gosh! You can ask. The funny thing is, you can ask any one of my friends, or you can ask even ask the players, and the and if you ask them is coach smith dramatic they're gonna be like yes she is very dramatic (laughs) and so i don't know i think uh growing up i had a lot of friends tell me i should be on snl or tell me i should be an actress or whatever just throwing that stuff that was gonna be my next question is like why not acting school right yeah yeah um but uh (laughs) it was funny (laughs) i did take i took theater in college too i actually wanted to change my major in college to theater um but i was too far along I, i did rec and sport management Um, and they're like, yeah, you won't be able to finish if you change it to theater. But I had taken a theater class and I was obsessed. Like I, I played this part of this lady named Helga who was like trained bears or something. And I just ate it up. I was like, I got to get an accent for this lady. I got to like do all this just over the top. And so I think it was leading into my, um, I think it was my junior year too. I mean, a lot happened my junior year, um, just with, I mean, golf and then this, we had uh, this called the this thing uh, at Indiana State couldn't called a uh, student athlete talent show, and your team was represented in that, and you had to pretty much put on a performance for everybody in the athletic department, just like random people that lived oh in Terre Haute. So I was part of the SAC committee, and my one friend was uh, he was on the track team, and we got paired together as a group, and and so we had to think of an idea of what what to do for. Uh, our performance and so i'm like man you ever seen that show made i was like i really just want to be made into a slam poet like he's like he's like are you sure i was like yes i was like make me into a slam poet so we like got together and wrote this poem out and uh he's like all right i'll do this part and then you do this part and then i'll do this part then you do i was like all right sweet like let's do it and so, like, two days before the um, the athlete, the student-athlete talent show, he says, hey, I can't make it. You're going to have to do the whole thing on your own. Oh. I was like, okay, all right, all right, <laughs> let's do this. So I remember we were at a tournament. We were at a tournament in, um, 
uh, I want to say it may have been Evansville because it was later on during the, the fall season. And I wrote it on some cards. And as I was playing, I was out there just saying this <laughs> poem. Like, my competitors were probably like, They're not, she's not talking to us. Like, what? she's talking out loud to herself. And so I'm just memorizing this poem. Like, and I think I shot, like, par that day. Like, I didn't care about golf. I'm you like, weren't thinking about the wrong <laughs> stuff. It's probably a good was, mental, <laughs> yeah. mental uh, t- trick right there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, at the end of my round, I'm like, here you go. Here's my scorecard. I, gotta, I still got to practice this. So we went up there, and, and it came t- time for the student-athlete talent show, and, and my teammates were like, you're going to kill it. Like, you'll be fine, like all this stuff. So went up there, and I performed it, and at the end of it, it's like everybody's giving me, like, the snaps. And oh, stuff, yeah. Like, yep, the snaps. Like, yeah. yeah, for, like, poets and stuff. And I just remember being on that stage, and the lights were hitting me, and I could only see the people in the front row. But I was just going at it. I was you like, loved it. I'm not, I loved it. I just oh I, I, that the nervousness. It was the nervousness that I I, I loved too, mm-hmm. and it was it was knowing that I was. A couple of my players got to see me perform one at Tennessee Tech. There was an open mic night. That was my, and, that was my question. Yeah, that I got yeah. from from Coach Brown. He said, "Ask her about the Tennessee Tech." Yeah, yeah. Poet so, slam. Just being like, they even said before they're like, you, you like, went from Coach Smith to like this bomb ass person with like you, you're throwing out your arms, you're like raising your fist, you're like yeah. giving it to the people, giving them what they wanted. You and transformed. Was, yes, <laughs> and I was like, that's how I felt that first student athlete talent show, and I was like, I think it was like an out of body experience, and I was just like, it, it was about it was about being a student athlete and. Um, the message in that poem was uh, kind of trying to think the best way to describe it of knowing that your your passion is in your veins. It's your. Do, do you remember? Athlete. Do you remember any of the lines? Can you recite oh, some yeah. of the lines? Uh, oh yeah. Give us a couple. Remember, give us a couple lines. Um. So it was called in due time. So I'll just do like maybe the first part of it. Yeah. Um, Okay. So in due time, my alarm will chime. I lay in bed already awake, already feeling the morning grind. 530, 530, five, Amanda, wake up. A meeting with gravity awaits and by gravity, I mean, weights pushing you back down in the earth, back into your place. And so that was the first part of it. Oh, it's sick. (laughs) That is so sick. I'm I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so, that's awesome. Yeah, so it was. Oh, it man. felt really good, and then I, I decided they actually, um, they asked me. I want to say, at the end of junior year, they usually do an award show for the the spring sports. It's like the I want to say the president's award. They have the all American all conference. They had a, usually a um, a banquet for that, and the um, athletic director had texted my coach and was saying, "Hey, would Amanda want to do a poem?" And I was like. What? Like, there was, like, five days before the, the awards thing. I was like, what? These people think I'm just thinking about this stuff constantly? Yeah. Like, I could just, like, do it? And so <laughs> I wrote I wrote another one for that, and I jumped up on stage and did that one. Um, and, yeah, so I it's just... It's a passion. It's, it's it clearly is. a passion for you. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. How much do you do it now? Like, do you do it in your spare time, just write poems, or do you yeah, think about I, stuff? I mean, what do you, what do you think you're going to do with that, if anything? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, just I did something, a, couple, a nice little hobby for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it is. There's, there's a few times. I mean, I, I would love to if there's another open mic night or something where I can just yeah. jump on stage and do the recent one that I did at Tech. Like, I would love to to see if I can still do it or kind of just, I don't know, just throw it out there at people yeah. and see what happens. And, any, any like poetry influences? Like, were there any like poets that inspired you or? Is it just off the dome, just start writing? I mean, how does that look? What's that look like, the process? Um, well, the one that I wrote, actually, um, I want to say it was it was kind of crazy. So I tore my ACL, and I oh, that was my, I want to say, it was right before I decided to go pro was when I tore my ACL. And I remember um, my one friend was like, I really want you to write a poem, like, off of, like, what you're feeling, off of what's been going on with you trying to, get back into playing professional golf and then mm-hmm. you know when you're going through an injury he's like I really want to hear what you gotta say about but but do it in a poem and I'm like okay gosh and so I um I'm a huge fan of J. Cole like J. Cole is is top nice. like, he's number one so he's got like the best lyrics lyrics ever so I remember I was looking up kind of 
um, I was I would listen to a lot of his songs and feel his rhythm and feel kind of how he meshed certain themes together with um, what he was trying to say. And I remember just sitting there writing this poem and kind of I heard his how he kind of meshed words together and put different storylines with each one. And so I started to create kind of that same, that look and kind of saying, okay, how is this word going to metaphor into this word or how is that going to work into this, into this word? So, um, just kind of listening to that kind of stuff, I guess the Mm -hmm. lyrics behind what he does and the rhythms. And then also, um, I watched a lot of button poetry and that's where people throw up stuff with, with them standing on stage and just letting it all go. And I'm like, all right, I I want to do this. So So kind of more like improv type of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which you said you'd done a little bit of like, what, what did you do improv at? Um, so I actually, when I was, um, right before I tore my ACL, I was out in Colorado working with train to be clutch, the guys who wrote burn your goals. Mm-hmm. So I was living out there with them and at the time kind of helping them write their next book and kind of just bouncing ideas like as a s- old student athlete, um, and kind of helping them out with that. And I was like, I'm so close to Denver. Let's see, like, what they got in their town. And, oh, no. and so I saw Denver Improv, so I was like, I'm just going to go. I'm like, just do it. Just walk in the door. See what you're putting yourself into. And I remember the first day, they acted like they knew me. I was like, all right, this is kind of weird. But that's how the vibe was. It was like, right. you just got to just let like it you all belong. go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I yeah. remember the first, the, one of the first things we did was we got on stage and the lady who was directing it all, um, there was, I want to say, about five of us on stage, and then there was five people sitting in the audience. So it was very, very small. It wasn't It wasn't like it was a huge improv thing. And she goes, I just want you, we're going we're gonna to pick a topic, and the five people that are going to be up on stage, you're going to stand up to the front of the stage and say, say a joke about that topic, and then you're going to walk back. And then she goes, and then the people in the stands you're going to just laugh hysterically at anything they say, anything. Like I could just say like boobop beep. And then these people in the stands would just go crazy, like just insane, like just clapping and cheering. And so I remember they were like, Oh, the first, the first, um, the first category is space. And so I was like, all these guys kept coming up saying funny things. And, and, uh, and I went up there and I was like, I said something like, you turn me right round, baby. And then I hear like this massive roar. (laughs) And I'm like, that was so stupid. And I just like walked back with this big smile on my face. (laughs) And I was like, this is great. I was like, this, I feel like we're best friends. And and so it was, it was definitely, I don't know, if you, if I just want anybody to do it. Anybody and everybody. I I took my friend that I lived out there with and she's like the biggest introvert. And I was like, just come, just do it. And she's like, yeah. okay. So. It'd be great for anybody. I'm, I'm such a big, I'm a big fan of that. I'm, I'm a big comedy fan. Mm-hmm. And then so I like, there's a lot and there's some new, I, I try to think of the guy that was on, uh, gosh, I'm spacing. But there's a there's an, improv, there's an improv show now on Netflix that was really good. Yeah. Um, but I will think of it later. But so, so I, I love that. And then I love you know, old school rap as we've talked about before. So the rap thing, like they're poets, right? They're wordsmiths. Mm -hmm. So, so I got to ask you the question, why do the kids call you DJ Smith? (laughs) Is it, is that a rapper name or are you like on the wheels of steel, like spinning? (laughs) What's going on? You got to tell me that story. So I used to, (laughs) it was in college. um, And uh, we had this, we had this email address that was like, it was your, uh, first letter of your first name, then your last name, and then it had however many people were in your same went went to Indiana State. So mine was a Smith one five two at sycamores dot and so <laughs> there would, we did parties at our houses, and so they needed a DJ. So I was like, you know what? Like I got this virtual DJ on my computer. I have a system to be able to do this. Like I just happen to have it, you know, yeah. and so. They're like, Amanda, like, we'll set you up a booth. We'll set you up a thing. And and so they called me, like, I was like, well, what should my name be? They're like, oh, well, 
anything that like anything you want. So I was like, all right, just make it DJ A Smith one five two at Sycamores dot. I understand. Nice. To, just for for people to get a hold of me, I guess was like uh, trying to trying to get my name out there. So it stuck. It, they just would make fun of me and call me DJ A Smith one five two all the time. So that's I was like, awesome. That's just what it is. It's so I've be- I've heard stories from the kids from the boys. It's yeah. like what's on what's on the playlist. Cause that, <laughs> what? Give me some of your, give me some of your favorite groups or, or rappers or singers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I knew it. Um, well, J Cole's number one. That yeah, he, he has I my like, heart. That's solid. It's Charlie, uh, Charlie kid. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Drake, Drake's up there. Um, okay. I gotta go with Mac Miller. Sad, sad, but gotta uh, go with him. R.I.P. He's, yes, his flow is just. I mean, he ch- he changed too. I think he kind of developed oh, yeah. in himself, developed as an artist, and kind of. I mean, he when he started with um, uh, Donald Trump and and his old stuff, I think he kind of developed into really what it is to be in Hollywood and and that whole scene. Mm-hmm. So that was cool to hear him. Uh, Logic, um, definitely. Nice. There yeah, you go. Yeah, I love. Um, Big Logic fan. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. He did I love his album? Um, it's sad that I love it and I can't think of what it's called. Yeah, I'm, I'm horrible at um, that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, He's got so I'll, many. Yeah, I'll remember it down the road. But <laughs> yeah. I love his. It, it's cool. It's really cool. I'm a big fan of the young guys that you can tell where they got their inspiration from. So yeah. Logic was huge with Jim yeah. Cole. Big he was big huge. storyteller. You know about his childhood and. Yeah, how he came up and beat adversity. I mean, he's got such a great story, and he's just an inspiration, I think, to a lot of people, a lot of kids. Yeah, yeah definitely. And then um, I gotta throw Jay Jay in there. Um, he's his book was amazing too. Uh, that kind of it hit me how much he was able to, I guess, start the new rap game where it was um, the young generation. I want to say it wasn't who, who just, are you talking about J Cole. Uh, uh, no, Jay Z. Jay Z. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he had kind of the the transition of when he did one of his first albums with he had Biggie on there, and then kind mm-hmm. of he was a, when Biggie died, he was able to kind of transition in, into that that rapper from Brooklyn and, and take on that role. So Absolutely. I mean, I gotta he's got to be just out of respect, he's got to be number number one for the whole thing. But J Cole is in my heart is number one. Awesome. Yeah, that's so good. All right, so back to back to coaching and golf. Like you, you go and you turn pro, and talk a little bit about that. And then how do you get to? You coach a little bit. Did you coach a little bit at Indiana State right before you came to Tech? Yeah. Is that yeah, what? So yes. So yeah, t- tell us how you got to be at Tech at Tennessee Tech. Yeah, um, I was so after I had done my graduate assistant at Indiana State, I was there for one full year. That's right. That okay. summer was when I went to Colorado, tore my ACL, and then that whole year transitioning um, back to to kind of wanting to be pro um, was like I kind of did a couple tournaments and stuff with them, but I mainly was recovering and then trying mm-hmm. to play. And some a little cactus stuff. tour I saw he played. Yeah, yeah. So I went out to <laughs> – Mike Brown. <laughs> Mike Brown. Oh, he's great. He's – Oh man, I wish he could. If he listens to this, I don't know if he will, but he he's, might. <laughs> you know, our good friends is yeah. his daughter. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and, he's, and, he cracks yeah. me up. Yeah. He's just every tournament he's out there on the first the first tee box with like a bunch of goodies. He's got like waters. He's got like music blaring, and he's got his tent that set sounds up. Sounds like and, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, 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 he's crazy. The best. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went out to Arizona for um, two years and played on the Cactus Tour. My first year. Just it was, um, it was, I was kind of oblivious to everything and, and kind of what it takes. And, and I, man, I, like I really wanted it. So I grinded really, really hard. I, I worked out at TPC Scottsdale. Mm-hmm. I was able to practice and play there. Um, a huge thing was for me to see the pros that were out there and what they did. And just they had their, like we weren't allowed to talk to them because it was their work. So for me to mm-hmm. see that and kind of say, okay, I got to separate it. I got to be able to say like, hey, I'm, if this is really what I want to do, I got to be able to go to a golf course and say like, all right, this is my work. Like, this, this is your is job. When, That's yeah, right. this is my job. Yep. So I took that and being able to see them do that and say, okay, I have to say no to certain things. And, and me being out here on my own, I moved out there on my own. I didn't have anybody. One of my roommate was actually, he went to Indiana State. So I had one person that I was connected to, but 
I just went out there on my own and saying, this is what I want to do. I want to mm. be a professional. I want to try this. I want to, and that's the thing I want, I said, I want to try this and I don't know what it's going to look like. And I don't know what it's, what it, what other people are doing. I don't care. Like mm. I, I want to try this. And so when I moved out to Arizona, I did that. And my first couple tournaments, um, I think I went top five in my first tournament and then I missed the cut in my second tournament and that made me so angry because I was like you just got top five in your first tournament you ever played and then you just missed the cut in your second one it was like my first time missing the cut because in college you don't have cuts right. so I was like it, it drew me back on what do I really need to practice what do I really need to focus on leading into the next tournament and then the next one, I ended up going um, 66 in my first round, then 70 in my second, and I was in the lead going the last day. And I was like, "What? I don't know who this. I don't know who this golfer is." And so that last day, I had the nerves back. I had the anxiety kind of hitting me a little bit. But then I also, what was cool about that was. I needed to be in that position because I'd never really been in that position. I needed mm-hmm. to be where I was having the lead after two days it's one thing to have a lead after one day but to hold on to it and shoot the next day to shoot really really well in a professional tournament um i needed to have that going to the last day and how i would react to that i reacted so bad but i learned so much because i was playing with a girl that was on the LP- lpga i was going against her okay in my, co- in my and so after the round i so i shot 77 in the last round she shot like i think a 68 in the last round so I just was out of it but so what did you learn I learned that it just just the like the stoicness that she had just the mental the calmness that she had like the mental toughness that she's like I'm gonna take this girl's money like she said that about I could just feel her saying that about me (laughs) but it was like she didn't care she's like I'm just gonna take this girl's money like she can try she can try her best but I'm I know what I'm doing out here and I could feel that from her and I was like I want that I was like, I yeah. really want that. We got, I call that taking up space. Yeah. Like she had, you know, the swag and like I told her to talk to Nick about that all the time. Yeah. Like just take up space. He hates it when I say that, but it's, it's, it's reality. Like you mm-hmm. can, if you show up to the, to the tee, you look at the range, you can tell the kids that take up space. Yeah. Yeah. You they know? have an yeah. attitude about it. Absolutely. It's, it's an attitude. It's, Absolutely. It's, and I think you got to learn that. You kind of, you you got to experience what it is not to feel that and then right. know what it takes to get to that. It's the confidence level. It's not the arrogance level. It's the confidence level. No, no. It's just, yeah, it's just knowing you belong and acting like you belong. And it's the body language. And it's, like you said, you felt it. Like you felt yeah. the wrath of that girl taking up space. Yep, exactly. And yeah. so I loved that. I, I love that feeling of kind of, and it's kind of weird. I, I started to really examine that and how she did that and and I took it into other tournaments and and I I missed certain cuts or I, I played really well but I was kind of like this is what I'm learning how to do mm-hmm. and so um I had gone into my second Q school my first Q school was I didn't really get the whole pro experience yet I didn't move out to Arizona yet so it was right before I moved out to Arizona and really started mm-hmm. playing in cactus events um that was a feeling of um the I can be here type of attitude. Um, and then when I tried it for a second time, I was like, I really want this. Like I really want to, to showcase, to showcase all the practice I've been putting in and, and all that. And unfortunately I, I went, I was just right on the cut line going in that last day and all those same little thoughts started to creep in. Yeah. And, and I remember that last day I was just, and I, I think I remember missing a small little putt, um, and I looked at my caddy and I was like, what's going on? And he's like, you're tired. He's like, you're just, you're tired. And I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I am. And just the thoughts start creeping in and, and, yeah. um, I needed to be in that position too. And to know what that feels like. So, um, after that I decided, um, I, I still kept playing on the cactus stuff. I still, um, was throwing stuff in with, um, the uh, Arizona Women's Open played in that too, mm-hmm. and I still worked at the time too, so I was trying to afford to play, afford to play on my own, and to um, to work at the same time. That's tough. It when you was, don't have yeah. sponsor money, like you're trying, and like t- going back, and this is something that I always ask my mini tour players when they mm-hmm. first come to see me. I was like, "Do you have a sponsor, or are you trying to work for entry fees?" And when they tell me that, like that's a hard road. It's hard yeah. enough if you don't. 
So, like, what were you doing to, to make money to, for entry fees? It was just, uh, it was working at TPC, TPC Scottsdale. I was oh, okay, so you were working at the yeah. court. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. like, you're grinding. That's serious grind right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember waking up at, when we had to open, I had to be at the course by 4.30, and then I would get oh. off around, like, 1, and then I would take maybe, I would just go change sometimes and just go play right after that. Wow. Um, yeah, and so it was hard to get in a full 18, um, I would usually play nine holes and hit the range as best I could, hit chipping mm-hmm. and putting. I, I mean, I honestly was so grateful to be there because they had a, such a nice area to, to putt and such a nice area for long, like short short game stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm really thankful to be here, but also it's it's a lot. It's a lot of working and then yeah. playing and then also, I mean, you got to hit the gym too. You got to you got to make sure you're you're getting back in time to eat a good meal and then wake up and, and make sure you you do it all over again and it's yeah it was hard yeah and i kind of i could feel it kind of leaving into me when i would miss a couple cuts or not make any money or something like that. i could feel that that pressure of of being like all right now i gotta work harder to pay for the next one you know right and, that's tough and so, yeah and i remember so what, what was the breaking point at like what made you decide to stop trying and and start getting you know, or getting into coaching what's what's that story um, so I had actually gone back to um, so the coach or the the class that I helped when I was a graduate assistant it was coming up on their senior year, so I decided I wanted to um, help them out at conference. Mm-hmm. So I decided to surprise them and fly into um, Valpo and um, help them out, just kind of being their assistant out there with them. And I remember I was out there and I just, I don't know, I just was loving it all over again. And it was like, I don't, I don't know if I was helping them or not, but it was just the fact that like I was there with them and just right. being able to kind of give them that wisdom again. And some of the ones that were freshmen, when I saw them as seniors, I was, it was just, it felt like I hadn't left. It felt like they're like, okay, we need you to help us out here on this hole and we need you to help us with this or whatever. And Hey, I want, I want you to walk with me or something like that. And, um, it was the last day and we just got done playing and the head, my old head coach Greg came up to me and he's like hey the Bradley um, athletic director wants to maybe set up an interview for you to if you want to become the head coach and I was like wait what I was like I'm, but I'm still out in Arizona like I'm still trying to play like I'm I'm still like I still have that whole thought in the back of my head and he's mm-hmm. like he's like I told him you would I told him you'd do the interview I was like what <laughs> He's like, <laughs> he's Made like, the yeah, decision he's, for you. Yes, he's like, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give him your number, and he's probably gonna call you in the next couple of weeks. And I'm like, okay. I was like, all right. Once again, with my old coach, like, all right, let's do this thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so I, um, I got on the, I, I worked my way into getting the interview with them, um, and it was with the men's head coach and then the women's um, senior. Um, advisor I want to say it was what her name was uh, she was part of the athletic department and I got on the interview and I bombed it I was so bad it was just the worst it was a terrible really? interview yeah like uh-huh. I, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself to kind of say I was I could like I guess that I knew what it was like to coach semi but I, to be the head coach yeah. I was like oh man like how how do I really portray that I know it's almost like you know you're you know it's up here. It's, you know, it's in your brain, but it's hard to articulate because sure. you know, it's up there. So it's, it was hard for me to do that when they did the interview and they didn't give me a call back or anything. So I was like, okay, like, uh, does this really what I want to do? And, and so at that time I was kind of down on myself, but then I wrote down in my journal, I said, maybe getting the head coach's job at Bradley was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. And so I eventually saw on some job listings that um, Tennessee Tech was hiring an assistant coach for the, for the men's and women's. And I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to do it. Like, it's crapshoot. I'm going to see what happens because I know I, I'm lucky enough to have had the head coach's interview. Um, so I'm going to see what happens with this. And um, Polk hadn't called me for like a month. And I was like, oh, like, I don't know what's going to happen because the the um, the deadline had passed and so a month had passed for Mm. when people could put in their their resumes and i was up in michigan playing in the michigan women's open and the first i had the first day i shot 84 so i'm like oh god like it was a worse round i think i had all year is so bad i shot 84 
And I was like, man, I got to, I got to do something tomorrow just to, to make the cut. And I, I'm thinking all this. And then all of a sudden I get back to our host family's house and I see on my phone that there's a voicemail from Polk Brown. And I'm like, all right, this is kind of weird. So I, I listened to it and he's like, Hey Amanda, like, I'd love to do an interview with you. Like we're still looking for this assistant coach's position. And I was like, I was like, whew, like a weight just, it was meant to be. I went the next day and shot two under and I made the cut. (laughs) And I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. So the next day I I called him up and and we had talked and he's asking me all this stuff about um, like me personally and just how I got into golf and and kind of where where I could kind of maybe make a difference in a program or or just kind of just the leadership role type of stuff. And he really touched on just relationships and and I was able Mm to have that genuine conversation with him. And, um, the next day he called me back and he's like, yeah, so we really want you to be with us. And I was like, Uh I I didn't see in the campus. I didn't even see like any of this stuff. And, um, I remember calling one of my, one of my big mentors that night Cause I told him, I was like, Hey, I really want to talk to like my family. Like I want to, I want to make sure this isn't just something I'm jumping into. Sure. And I talked to one of my mentors that night about it. And, um, he's like, I was, he's like, what are you thinking, Amanda? He's like, take it. He's like, with all the stuff that you've done, like you'll figure it out. Yeah. And for him to say that, I was like, I was like, all right. You know, I got to have that confidence in myself and just say, yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. And like you were saying, when he, he made that call, it was meant to be. It was meant to be Absolutely. what I was, I was stressing about that. I was thinking, am I still going to try to go play pro? I, I mean, all my brain, it was like, all right, another year of Q school, you know, and, and saying mm-hmm. that kind of if I can't, in the back of my head, it's like if I can't make open tournaments where I'm making a cut, how the heck am I going to go, go to Q school and feel good about playing, right. you know? And so just having that thought in the back of my head and him saying and him calling me right after that happened and having that just general relief that, you know, this game is giving you this platform, take it, you know? So, yeah, I mean, really it, that's, that's amazing. I mean, based on the, what I know about you and, and then this interview, like you were made to be a coach. I mean, really, I mean, it's like, you're so young now. I mean, you're going to, you're going to look back and be like, okay, that was the best decision I ever made. Right. I mean, cause you're so self-aware mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's just, it's such a gift. Talk a little bit before, before we get into, I got some, I got some questions from the team okay. or from, from the, from, from the boys, but there was a few things that I had like questions that I had about, you know, what did you learn? One was, what did you learn from your first year? Like any, anything come to mind? And then I'm curious to know. You know, when you guys are doing tournaments and you're walking with players, right? So I think that's a big – because I know you, and, you and, and Coach Brown, you know, that's a big decision. Like, who are you going to walk with? And then just some insight into, like, how you handle that because that's a very – it's a very important part of college golf and, like, what to say, when to say it, how to yeah. handle players. Like, just anything that comes to mind with that. Yeah. Um, so I guess with the first question of, like, what did I learn? Yeah, what did you learn? <laughs> Yeah, I think it dives into that, too, is when you're out there walking with a player and what to say and what not to say. Um, a lot with the guys, um, what I kind of touched on earlier, kind of owning owning myself and kind of owning what I could do and, and how I could really help people, I think was with them is it's just be more direct and kind of not sugarcoat things. I think um, the way that the way that I respect people is I listen to them. I really, I really do want to build a relationship with them and, and kind of get their side of things and, and in hopes that it, it kind of gets put in return of, Hey, are you going to listen to me too? And I mean that you got to work at that. You got to work at that trust. Um, but getting, getting in a position with the guys and saying, Hey, I know my shit, but it's to the point of I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to respect the way that you've developed yourself as a player, Mm -hmm. but I'm also not going to leave out that I think you can work on this. Or I think that, um, a couple of things with, the the guys, the first tournament I was out there with them, um, there was, (laughs) I'm going to, I'm just going to tell this story. Stories would be good. Like, this would be a, uh, Bryce can probably attribute to this one. Um, <laughs> I was out there with Bryce and I walked a lot with Bryce. He was the, I walked with him at, yeah, you guys like, seem to have know, a connection. Yeah. 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 Um, he had actually, I was working one of the holes in St. Louis. Um, I was posted up on, I think it may have been number 10 and it was a drivable par four. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but with a lot of the, the wind that was into us, um, there was a, a room for air, I guess, on that day, um, where if you, if you pulled out driver, it was going to be where you didn't really know where you're going. Um, so we were sitting on the tee box and, and he's like, I'm pulling it out. He's like, I'm doing it. I'm just going to rip this. I'm gonna Bryce like hit, hit and... driver off the deck if he could. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, I'm, here's my first turn with this kid. Like I'm learning all this. And, um, I'm hanging back on it. And, and I, it's funny. He was pulling up the driver and he was standing behind the ball and, uh, we're talking still, we're kind of talking about what he should do. And I'm like, you know, Bryce, I was like a seven iron. You got a lot of room up there. The gap is a lot bigger. You have this much more room to be able to hit. And I know you can hit, I'm like, you're confident enough in your pitching wedge to stick it there close. I know you are. And so we're standing there and He's standing behind the ball with his driver, and I keep getting closer and closer to him, almost like taking up that space of where he's able to just get to his ball. Because I'm like, I just gotta like get this in this this kid's brain. And um, he he whips out driver, he hits it, and he hits it into the creek um, right mm-hmm. before the game. Yeah, I remember that hole. Yeah, and I, I'm watching him the whole time, just walking up to this ball, and he's like. It's one of those things where they don't put the club back in their bag yet, and they're just yeah, swinging just... it, just kind of like, oh, like so mad. And I'd see him take a drop, but I had to hang back because I think Will was coming up next, either Will or Brackton. Mm-hmm. And it was they were the last person, so I had to hang back and just watch him do his thing. And I'm seeing he take his hat off. He's like, he's rubbing his head, like just kind of like just the sweat away, and just like freaking out that he just hit it in this creek. And I'm texting coach, and I'm like, Bryce hits it, hit it in the creek, like he's taking the drop, da da da. And um, Will hits, um, gets a birdie on the hole. So I'm like, I'm not going to stick with Will. Like, he's already probably going. He's going. Mm-hmm. And so I, he's like, Coach Sexton, he's like, go up to Bryce. Like, just work with him because it seems like he might be struggling a little bit. So I get up to Bryce, and he hits his tee shot. So I'm about ready to w- start walking with him. And I go, Bryce, he's like stressing out. I go, I don't want you to say another fucking word. I just want to see you hit fucking good shots. And he goes, what? Yes. He looks at me, he's like, what? And I'm like, so the whole time walking down that fairway, silence. And I'm like, in, internally, I'm like, oh my God, why did I say that? Like, I'm like, I love out. it. But at the same time, I'm like, I, I don't want to hear you say another word because that whole time yeah. we were talking on that tee box, it's like, if you're going to pull the trigger, pull the trigger. Like, yeah. I, I, Indecision I, I, leads to yeah. mistakes, which obviously happened. He yeah. wasn't committed, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, I, don't, I just don't want, I, I just want no talk, just hit freaking good shots. I love it. And so at the end of the round, at the end of the day or whatever, he like, we're all sitting there eating pizza or whatever. And he's like, Coach Smith told me to shut the hell up or something. <laughs> <laughs> like I did. Yes. That's yes, great. I did. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's the thing that I learned is, like I'm not going to sugarcoat it with them and I don't think they want that. So it's it's something that I would want that in return. I'd want my coach saying, "Hey, like you struggled with this today. I'm going to teach you how to do how to do it differently or mm-hmm. or hey, you're that's something that's not helping you. So let's stop doing that." You know, and, and Well, so, how difficult like was it to gain their respect, their respect being new and all of a sudden being a woman, let's face it, right? I mean, it's probably yeah. wasn't easy with the guys. Yeah. Because you probably had to, like, you know, one, you're a great player. So you're probably like, right, I'll give you two aside right now or let's go play. Yeah. But, I yeah. mean, how did you how did you sort of get yourself into that respect mode with mm-hmm. the boys? And what did that what did that happen? Um, <laughs> I mean, really. It's probably I'm tough gonna, to say, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough to gauge because they're all different. Um, yeah. I think with a couple of them that are a little bit more emotional, it's it kind of like leaning back and being like, Hey, I'll be, I'll be like a word of wisdom, like wisdom yeah. type of type of person with you. Um, uh, it, I want to say it does take that just time, like time being out there with them. I remember when I first got there and, um, one of them needed help with their wedges and I was like, yeah, let's go out. I was like, let's go hit some wedges. And he was having trouble kind of gauging how far to hit one with, with, um, 60 yards and 80 yards with like a a little bit of a back to it or like a slope to it. And I said, 
I was like showing him kind of just how to take more loft off of it and just kind of playing around with the club with him. And he's kind mm-hmm. of like looking at me like, what the heck? Like she can do yeah. all that. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, you got to learn that as when you're trying to play as much as possible, like the best ones, best girls are the best with their wedges, like 60, 70, 80, like you'll see them throwing it in there at the pin just right. all the time. So getting out there and kind of throwing that at them and seeing them be like, okay. Like, That's the best way to different. get their respect. Yeah. Exactly. Like, hey, she can actually hit it. Yeah. Like, it's like maybe I should listen to her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you yeah. should. I know <laughs> I know you've had a big influence on my son. Nick's always like, we love the quote, just keep showing up, right? Uh, you always yeah. say, just show up, man. Just keep showing yeah. up. Yeah. So I, I he think does. Yeah. I mean, the, he, and uh, he's been nothing but he just loves you so much. Oh, well, great. thanks. Yeah, he's he's awesome. His energy is, it can go miles and miles. It's it's honestly the best. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's get in. Let's get into some questions from the from the team. All okay. right. Uh, so number one, what was your most rewarding part? Uh, we kind of covered this, but some of this might be redundant. But what's your? I want to ans- ask it because the boys have you know they reached out. Mm-hmm. What's the most rewarding part of coaching for you? Um. I would say probably the I want to say like the look on their face when they figure it out, like it's just the aha the, moment. The aha we call moment it in teaching, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's the point that it's like you didn't really have to be there for it. Like there's been times where I'm like, well, what'd you learn or something? And they're just kind of like, oh, I learned how simple it is to da 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 or whatever, and you're just kind of like, you. I, you've almost felt in their shoes you've learned from that failure to so to them to be aware of that I guess is the best feeling and seeing that they they're able to admit that about themselves too that they weren't very good at this and then they had a struggle and they worked through that struggle and they're understanding there's beauty in that struggle and then they've come to where they want to be at so it was it's cool to kind of to look back and kind of say that you we're able to see that, I guess. Right. And in, inspire it. Right. You had mm-hmm. an influence on that. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. What was your most memorable moment as a student athlete? I mean, you may have covered it with your tournaments, but anything come to mind? Like what would be your most memorable moment? As a student athlete? Yeah. In college. Um, I would say it was probably that. It was probably that day of, of being up there on that green and seeing the my teammates and seeing shooting my 68. family and shooting sixty eight and yeah. just just being out there and it's loving great. it. Yeah, it was, yeah. That was it's such a memory. great. I mean, it, the fact that you can remember all that and like remember how you felt, mm-hmm. I think is so cool. All right, so what is what is one value that you try to instill in all of your players? It'd probably be the. It's okay to struggle, I guess. Um, that's something that I think a lot of people want to bypass. I think a lot of people want to bypass that, that they have to go through that, that they have to not be good at something to start. And so I really want to challenge them and to know that that's okay. Um, and like I said before, maybe taking them out on, on a whole, like um, I would take when Bryce and Cameron were both hurt I would make them, not make them, we would go out, we'd read first when they got there because they couldn't do much on the course, uh, hit on the range and stuff. So I had a couple books and they'd, I'd like, all right, come in the office and I'd throw some books at them. They're like, oh, yeah? oh, Coach Smith, why are we doing this? Yeah, yeah. And so they would read a little bit. I had um, Bryce read Mindset and then Cameron had read um, No Hero. So that was something that he kind of grew, grew into, I think, he liked the stories that that the marine was talking about so mm-hmm. that was his forte and then bryce was um in mindset there's a lot of michael jordan stuff so i threw that at him kind of that nice the way michael jordan dealt with certain things and so when they were both hurt um i had him jump in there and read a little bit then we would i take him to a putting green and um i really wanted to with both of them kind of say what are you feeling right now being hurt what are you learning from being hurt what is something that you I guess are understanding about yourself when you're hurt 
mm-hmm. when you're injured, when you can't play the thing that you love to play, <clears throat> where are you at right now? And I think for both of them, it was a very, very much like a, a left out feeling one or just falling behind feeling two. Mm-hmm. And um, I hate when when people say, like, I got to get the rust off. It's like, no, you're figuring out how this is making you better. You're figuring that out slowly. It's not about going back to how you were. It's about being able to use that to your advantage and knowing that whatever happened to you, whatever injury is happening to you right now is in your best interest. And so for me to be there and with them and saying, hey, let's go work on our putting instead. Let's go work on our mental game instead. And you don't need to be hitting golf balls right now because this is where you need to be struggling. That's and really so, good. Yeah, so to be able to do that with them, <clears> I felt I didn't have to – it wasn't about the golf anymore. It was about, okay, I, I went through an ACL tear, and that, that changed how I saw my life. I couldn't walk for two months. How did I deal with that? You know, and so – as an athlete, you want to define yourself kind of on how you play or on what your teammates think of you or what your parents think of you or, or right. um, in that aspect of how can I gain the approval from my golf standpoint. But instead, I, I try to really help them and say, how is this struggle of not being able to that approval you've always been wanting from this sport? How are you really learning from that? And yeah, it sounded it sounded like you because I know you're big on journaling as I mm-hmm. am. Did you introduce that to the kids? I mean, I, I know that they, they had to do that. And I love that when Nick said, I mean, we were keeping a journal. Like, I've been trying to get him to do that for five years when he was a junior <laughs> golfer and could, had no success. And I talked that, talked to that, you know, in, in that stance with a lot of my kids. But it's difficult to get them to actually sit down and write it down because they oh, I've got enough homework, right? Yeah. So how did you, how did you even get peop- the kids to do that? Like, you've got to share that. Um, well, it's, I mean, now it's still a little bit of struggle. Um, Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing, um, it's having them do it for the first couple times and kind of seeing how we can, how uh, Polk and I can kind of back up that stuff that they're writing and kind of saying, um, so we usually have them do five things that went well. Uh, three things that they want to improve on and then or yeah three things they want to improve on and then also writing down attached with those three things how am I going to improve on those so it's kind of the awareness of it and then what's something simple I can do in my next practice that I can take with me whether it be I think when I was doing it I wrote down like I got easily distracted so my next practice, how can I get better at that? I actually did a metronome on my YouTube, and I had the metronome going faster and faster and faster and faster. I was putting. And so was I getting distracted by how, fa- how fast the beat was, or was I still letting my mind understand what I was thinking about when I was putting? Mm. So just like the simple stuff like that, instead of just going into a practice and being like, okay, I shot 81 the other day. I had two three putts. Let me work on my putting. You know, so right. it was a very attached part of it that coach brown and i could really kind of say um what were you thinking at that point and how can we help you with that when you were doing that during your round yeah Um, that's so good and 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 when they start realizing they don't have to write a book right it's just the fact that they're organizing their brains and writing it down and the that portion of it is so helpful they don't realize it as young athletes that you're i mean it's like you're so you're you're so old you're such an old soul (laughs) Like it's I, that's why I love you so much. All right, so, so the next the next question is, what are your keys to success in life? Oh, gosh. Bonus if you oh, bonus, bonus if you can get the the kid that actually asked asked this. Uh, oh man, a bonus! What are my right? keys to success? That's pretty, it's pretty deep, right? It is. I feel like DJ Khaled. I got the keys. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, who would ask that? Maybe mm-hmm. I don't know. Bracton, I can't remember. No, uh, Ch- was it Chase? Oh no, Chase. No, 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 I'm gonna no, guess. no, no. It was not Bracton. Okay, probably Will. I don't know. No. Well, I got a <laughs> one out of ten spot to try it or nine spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just a couple of things. Just give us a just give us a few things. You've mentioned so much. I mean, like yeah. you're, it's all been interlaced in this conversation. But I, yeah. I wanted to ask. Um, keys to success. I would say, don't be afraid to look stupid. Like that's going to be failures, failure first, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Honestly, like I, the best thing I, I honestly think about my life is how good of a story this is going to be. 
you know, and it's kind of like you. Yeah. And I even with the journaling thing, I've got like four or five journals, and I'm like, damn, when am I going to start this book? You know, right. and, and kind of yeah. saying, how wild is it going to be? Where I'm You're gonna writing your reach? memoirs, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's got to be your own definition, one, and you got to not be afraid to look stupid when you're doing it. And so That's eventually fantastic. things will fall into place. Yeah. I'm just reading this. I just got a text from one of the players. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It's, it says, bring up that her being able to put herself into the player's shoes because she's been in those situations before and how they can help us. <laughs> I think we've kind of covered that. Or yeah. how that's an advantage for us. I mean, I think yeah, we've, we've kind of covered that. That's a good question, but that's more of the, yeah. what you've done, what you've done with the coaching and being able to, to walk alongside the kids and then having that respect that they know you're a good player and you've been there. Like you've been, you know, just what we've talked about. You've, you've been nervous in a tournament. Like you, you can empathize, right? So I mean, I think yeah. that's a big part of it. Um, all right. Last question. You'll be off the, off the hot seat here for the, <laughs> from the players. What was the best part of your game in college? And is there a specific reason that part of your game was better? Huh, that's a great question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, irons, I would say, oh my gosh, my, I loved having my irons in my hands. Um, eight iron was my favorite club. Um, so that's probably wasn't the best at putting. So it was probably, I just loved, I loved controlling the ball. And just when I'd be on the range, um, a lot of our teammates, we'd throw different stuff at each other. We'd play games and stuff. And one of my favorite ones was um, at the top of my swing, they had to yell out, draw, fade, or straight. Oh, yeah. I remember it. that one. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, <laughs> I would I would grab my team and be like, do this. Let's do this. And so <laughs> I think just my irons, I just love shaping it. I love being able to kind of, I don't know, put it in a different position and seeing how it would react, um, doing it slowly, seeing how it would react, kind of just with an iron kind of make closing the face and bringing it, drawing it inside and swooping it around and just being like, okay, I'm under a tree right now. Like, how do I get away from this? You know? And so I just practiced that all the time and just being out there and watching just the way the ball curved. I just was obsessed with my iron. So I would say that I would say my iron. Yeah, that's good. And how does that sort of, I mean, when we'll get to the last question here that you probably already know is coming, but the, like, how does that affect the way you structure practices or like any sort of fun games or drills that you like to give the kids to get the most out of the performance. Yeah. So, um, uh, there was a couple of things I did with the girls, like to start off with, um, on the range type of stuff was, um, taking each club and just hitting three balls with it and going through your bag. And you were just recognizing the tempo of your swing when you got to those higher up clubs Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to hit your higher up clubs harder or if you're trying to still do that same swing and still you weren't guiding the ball to do it. And then you worked your way back down and just recognizing with each club how that kind of how you were using that club and then how you kind of felt when you started doing it really well with the club maybe before it and then leading into that. So it kind of got your I don't know how it is for younger for younger girls. It's hard for them to hit their hybrids or their or their five irons or their six irons or something like that. So mm-hmm. being able to help them out with that on the range and saying kind of this is how the swing should feel with those clubs, even though you might be trying to blast it all the time because it's a, such a far distance. Yeah, it's a great so, tempo drill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of just sure. working the bag and being able to kind of see how that shot reacts or, or something with kind of like your wedges, seeing how far you got to hit it this low. Let's do something with that. I know Nick was doing a lot with that with the track man and kind of he'd pull me over and be like, I'm hitting it 30 degrees or something like that. And, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, oh, that's great. Like, let's just kind of see how the ball reacts and see if you can do it with this club or do it with that club and, and taking advantage of it that way. Yeah, that's really good. It's great advice. All right. So thank thank you so much for your time. We, we, I feel like we could go for like three more hours, maybe have to do <laughs> yes. part two and more more quotes and and whatnot. <laughs> but this is a good one to kind of get you out get you out with uh with your mantra or a quote Mm -hmm. if you had you know to get a message to the world and you had to put it on a gigantic billboard what would your message say and why yeah i've been thinking about this one because good if you heard the podcast everybody knows this one's coming so this is this is great yeah um i think i kind of like to think outside the box on a lot of stuff so um i wouldn't I'm almost thinking if I were driving down the road and if I were to see a billboard, like how much attention would I give it? Um, if it's something like a, a quick mantra that um, it would relate to me, I would probably say it's okay to be lost. 
one literally like when you're on the road like <laughs> when you're on the road like if I saw that billboard and I was lost I'd be like oh like thank goodness someone's got my back like I'm okay like I'm good you know and so that seeing, that on, <laughs> seeing that on a billboard like literally yes um I love like, it you can feel okay about being lost and enjoy the road while you're at it. Like, yeah, you're lost. You're probably stressed out about when you're going to reach your destination or when, or where you're even at. But sometimes there's beauty in just not knowing where you are and, yeah. and seeing that. And then figuratively as in, um, kind of along those lines, it's okay to be lost because you're going to figure it out. You're and it's okay to be it. stupid. It's okay to look yes. stupid. I love yeah. that so much. And yeah. Like in, in, in your young life, you've already done that plenty of times, and that's why that's why you're who you are. And I'm super excited to see what you're going to do in your career and the effect that you're going to have on, on young people is going to be unprecedented. Well, thank you. So, I appreciate it. Absolutely. So so tell tell everybody how they can follow you on Instagram and, and Twitter or, or any social platforms or anything else you want to put out. Yeah, so Instagram, it's uh, at DJASmith152Golf. Uh, of course DJ it is. underscore, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Twitter, it's uh, Mandarin23. That's high school days. So, um, And then also through my email, my uh, email through Tennessee Tech, you can also reach me through there. Absolutely. Young ladies out there wanting to play college golf or young men, uh, hit her up. And yep. uh, you want to you you be a part of this program. So I appreciate your time. Any, anything else I haven't asked you or any topics that we haven't covered before we close? Oh, that was great. It was good. Thanks yeah. so much for everything. Yeah, you too. I appreciate it. All right. Talk mm-hmm. to you later. All right. Bye-bye. What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you go. Uh, first, big thank you to Coach Smith for coming on the show and sharing her story and her incredible knowledge and insight on coaching and college golf. Uh, make sure you follow Coach on Twitter at Mandarin23 and IG at DJ underscore A Smith 152 Golf and give her a social wave and give Tech a follow on IG at TN Tech Men's Golf. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, Straight Down Apparel, NVDHemp.com. Uh, so also make sure that you take advantage of that 20% discount by putting in the Guru20 code when you buy all your CBD needs. And massive thank you to Swing U uh, for creating the app, the Golf Guru app that you can find in your app store. So download that. And for being such an incredible marketing team, uh, you can follow me and reach me on Twitter or Instagram at Golf Guru TV. Would love to chat with you. Shoot me a DM. Uh, also check out my website at golfgurutv.net where you can find more videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching. And if you want to be included in my weekly guru newsletter, just send me a DM with your email and I'll include you on that as well as I got tons of new content, videos, and information uh, on what I'm doing during the week. So if you have a question or comment, you can also DM me or just shoot me an email at golfgurushow at gmail.com. This show and all episodes of the Golf Guru Show were produced by myself, Jason Sutton. Music was provided by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And as I always leave you with my mantra, RIP Mr. Roan, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time.